You're listening to Secrets for Scaling, a Gecko Board podcast that explores the growth secrets of successful founders and CEOs. Whether you're just launching your business or taking your company to the next level, you'll learn proven strategies and tactics for growing a sustainable business. For this episode, we spoke with John O'Nolan, founder and CEO of Ghost, a fully open source hackable platform for building and running online publications. Hey, John, welcome to Secrets for Scaling. Hey, thanks for having me. We can go ahead and jump right in. Ghost turned three this year. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And you guys first launched from a successful Kickstarter campaign, right? Yes, absolutely correct. So in about uh, 2013, I think April 29th was the day it first went live to the world. So, and you raised almost 200,000 pounds with a goal of only 25. Why, That's right. Which is awesome. Mm-hmm. Why crowdfunding instead of private investment or a different option? Right. So um, Ghost is a publishing platform for journalists, um, and it's born out of uh, lots of ideas that, that I hold to be dear uh, to myself on, on a personal level. Um, so the, the original uh, kind of concept for the whole thing was, what if you could um, make a publishing platform for journalists completely open source and not do it to make it the next biggest company in the whole world, but do it so that the world would have something better within it to power um, the future of publishing, the future of journalism. Um, so from, from day one, the the idea was born in this capsule of it's about the idea and it's about the people who are going to use the end product. It's not about building the biggest thing to sell to Facebook or Google. Um, and we want to make it open source. And the, the kind of the most neutral and the most uh, appropriate way to stay true to those values um, I felt at the time was to set it up as a not-for-profit organization um, and to really have that that neutrality and that independence that is core to the values of journalism be core to the heart of our software. And when you set up a, a non-profit, aside from donations, uh, crowdfunding is just about the only thing you can raise. So you certainly can't go to venture capitalists and sell them shares because you don't have any. Um, and there aren't really any other loans banks want to give you because uh, traditionally non-profits don't make a whole lot of cash with which to repay loans. Uh, so going the Kickstarter route was kind of the most logical uh, way to bring it into existence, both from a philosophical point of view with the not-for-profit model, um, and as well as just from a kind of bootstrapping, get a startup off the ground point of view of, let's see if there are enough people out there willing to make this a viable business by backing it to get it off the ground. Yeah. I love the community feel too, around a platform like Ghost. It just seems to be a great fit. Definitely. So, and that's a lot of money for a technology Kickstarter campaign, I've heard, um, especially three years ago. Why do you think it was so successful? Uh, I think it was a lot of reasons. I think we touched um, on a lot of pain points people were having with existing um, technologies, existing platforms that they had been using up until that point. There was also this little golden moment in 2013, which was kind of like the renaissance of, of blogging when uh, suddenly lots of things started coming back. So this is around the time Medium started getting popular. Uh, it was around the time Subtle uh, was in vogue. Um a couple of the older ones had just shut down. So there was there was a lot of movement in kind of the publishing space, um, or at least the, the content management publishing space in 2013. And people were really looking for independent technology that was design-driven, that wasn't built on this kind of old bloated stack that you see in, in some of the older content management systems. Um, so I don't think it was any one thing. It was just the accumulation of lots of little things that came together in uh, the right place at the right time. That's great. Today, you're, how big is your team now? Uh, we're up to 10 full-time now working for the foundation. And then we have uh, a wider group of open source contributors and volunteers uh, numbering in, in the hundreds. How big are you in terms of market size and revenue? Uh, so revenue, we're currently at just over 720k uh, US dollars annual recurring, um, which is for the, the the platform as a service that we run. So we have the, the open source products, and then we also have a managed hosted service um, with which you can run the software, uh, which is where our revenue comes from. Uh, and in terms of market share, uh, I don't know. You, the, that's a very hard thing to quote. You can you can kind of look at like ha- what percentage of domains run certain software and try and claim it that way. But it's uh, it's a tricky one to really pin down with meaningful numbers. It's a fair point. Um, I think that first three years is some of the most challenging for many founders. What were some of the biggest challenges you faced in the past three years? <laughs> oh, uh, too many to list. 
I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's more a case like which one should we talk about? Um, so the the first year was was just kind of breakneck keep up with the demand from the Kickstarter campaign um, and people wanting the product to exist. And you know, is it done yet? Is it launched yet? And can we use it yet? And it was just going full tilt to try and get something out the door and and make it good. Um, the second year was full tilt. Uh, trying to prove the business model uh, to actually get revenue rolling in. So we had the Kickstarter money um, and that was our runway. We had to hit profitability by the time that Kickstarter money ran out uh, because there's no way of raising a second round. There's no way of raising any round. Um, so just building up the initial customer base and trying to make sure that our bank balance didn't hit zero before that happened to uh, to the inflection point at which point we'd be profitable. Uh, and then from from then on in, uh, the most challenging things after that, I guess, has been coping with, I would say, with early missteps in technology, which I, I guess is probably true for most technology companies. You just end up with some legacy underpinnings uh, that make it very hard to build on top of uh, when you have some stodgy foundations. So fixing up a lot of, of those things have been incredibly uh, big challenges. Gotcha. Yeah, I feel like with your approach, you we're pretty much forced to build a sustainable business, which is really refreshing in today's environment. Absolutely, yeah, no choice. <laughs> and you do zero marketing with 100% of Ghost's growth resulting from word of mouth. How'd that happen? That's right. Um, I would like to say it was this grand, amazing plan I came up with. Like, we're going to do no marketing, everything's going to be fine. Um, but it, I think, in truth, it was more... Ghost has always just sort of marketed itself. We've always had this quite active community of people who've cared about the mission as well as the products um, and what we're doing. And so in the beginning, we probably just didn't need to do marketing. And then since then, uh, haven't had to or haven't bothered to. Um, I'm sure we could we could do a lot better if we actually tried to do some marketing. But up until this point, we've been just been so focused on on building the products and building the things that we know people want Um that marketing's kind of taken a back seat, and fingers crossed, knock on wood, up until this point hasn't um, hasn't been a big a big problem for us. <laughs> Which is great. Other than building a product that people want, because I think that's the number one answer to organic success. Is there anything else there in terms of branding or community that helps not having to invest in marketing? Um. Oh, I don't know. So so many intangible things. I think. Uh, I. I whether you want to call it karma, whether you want to call it logic, whether you want to call it common sense of some degree, I think you, you tend to get back from the world whatever you put out into it. And our philosophy and the, and the way we approach everything we do has always been to try and do the right thing, whether that's by our team members, by our customers, um, by our open source developers or by our end users. Um, it's always to just try and do the right thing, the thing which feels like it is empirically good and the best for everyone involved. And I think that sentiment and that approach uh, is very visible in everything we do and has been, has been very, we've been rewarded for it, I think. Um, people see good and it's not as common as I think we all wish it was. So when they see it, they tend to uh, respect it and appreciate it. Um, so I think that's been that's been beneficial for us in in some ways. Yeah, I'd imagine that becoming a nonprofit too, like automatically signals that. I think it's uh, pretty cool when companies who aren't nonprofits also manage to put that out into the world. Definitely, yeah. Um. So, and you guys make all of your financial data available to everyone, which has become more common, but still isn't super common. Why is it? Um, kind of going back to the same things of, of transparency and, and openness and, and just doing the right thing as much as possible. Um, I think if you're, if you're building a nonprofit in particular, you really want to prove that you stand for the things you say you stand for, not just, you know, say we're doing this for the good of the world and journalism or whatever else, but, uh, have the proof to back it up. And of course, not everyone's in a position to be able to do that. We very fortunately are, and it's something I believe quite strongly in and, uh, I also like the idea that maybe it could one day help future businesses who are looking to do something similar, uh, learn from our mistakes and, and do something better, um, perhaps. So I think a lot of it also came from from seeing companies like Buffer and, and some of the, the more early startups sharing their revenue and being able to learn from that of wanting to just kind of pay, pay it forward and, and do the same thing. Uh, so very happy to be a part of that kind of trend. And I indeed, as you said, would like to see uh, more people do it. Yeah. Do you think that's impacted the success of Ghost at all? Um, somewhat. Uh, not to not to any 
directly tangible degree that I can really put my finger on and say, you know, because we have transparent revenue, uh, we were able to accomplish these extra things. I think in terms of another contributing factor to the overall sentiment towards the company and uh, what the company stands for, it's, again, just a a lot of little things uh, that in aggregate add up to something greater than the sum of their parts. Would you say that that level of transparency has impacted your team's performance? I think so. It's that's kind of a hard one to say because I don't have a direct comparison of what our team would be like if we weren't transparent. Um, and the, I mean, I'm probably slightly biased. The the optimist in me would like to say, yeah, I'm sure we'd we'd make worse decisions and uh, and everyone would be way less happy. But of course, I can't I can't say with absolute certainty. Um, but if anything, the one thing I can point to is that the full team, as well as our full community, uh, essentially has access to almost all of the data that we do internally. And that has helped um, in many instances with decision making. There's there's far less questions that I feel like we have to deal with um, internally in terms of why are we doing this or why are we going in that direction? Because everyone's working from the same set of data. There's no uh, uh, kind of hidden stuff. And that makes it from a founder point of view, a lot easier to get buy-in from the rest of the team and a lot easier to get alignment from everyone um, working towards the same things. Totally. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So with that data available, how do you and your team set goals? What does that process look like? Uh, so we, we have a number of different things. Um, and I, I wouldn't say we're the best in the world at this. It's particularly as the so we're now we're now at ten people. We're setting goals uh, as a team and, and working towards them, both long term and short term. Actually, makes sense. The first couple of years uh, was just three to four of us, uh, all kind of working on whatever needed to be worked on. Um, these days, we we use our team trips, of which we do two a year. So we're a fully remote company, but twice a year uh, we meet up for a team trip somewhere in the world. Uh, and at those times, we review our ten year plans, five year plans, two year plans, kind of the really long term stuff, what we want to accomplish and what we want to achieve and look forward to the things we might want to celebrate from Ghost and what would make us happy to have achieved with the products and the company. Uh, and then shorter term, we use OKRs, objectives and key results, uh, quarter to quarter, uh, to kind of make progress towards those goals in smaller iterative steps. Um, but it's a constant learning process. I don't, I don't think we're perfect by any means at setting and achieving goals, but um, working towards it. Yeah, I mean, I don't think anyone is, if that makes you feel any better. <laughs> So earlier this year, you wrote about some of your accomplishments and challenges in the past few years, and you mentioned paying off technical debts. Can you explain a little bit what that means? Yeah, absolutely. So this is the the thing I kind of touched on earlier in terms of biggest um, biggest challenges. And so early on, I think probably one of the biggest mis- missteps we ever made was um, we so we built Ghost is built in JavaScript, Node.js specifically, um, and we subcontracted out our main uh, marketing website, user system, billing platform, all of that stuff uh, to an agency to build for us because we there was only two of us at the time and we had to focus on building the products and so we just partnered with an agency who would help us uh, kind of build the the backend infrastructure if you will, uh, and they built it all in Ruby on Rails. Seemed like a fine idea at the time. There are lots of very successful businesses built on Ruby. Uh, the problem which we kind of failed to foresee, kind of obvious in hindsight, was that we didn't know any Ruby on Rails. So when the whole thing was done and inevitably needed to be maintained, had bugs, wanted to add features to it, um, every time we wanted to do something to it, we had to kind of go back to this agency and ask them to do it because that's not a language we code in or, uh, or framework we understand how to use. And that problem kind of uh, grew and snowballs over the subsequent years as we had more and more and more users uh, and more and more and more things breaking uh, and was is the single biggest thing I think that has held us back in terms of eating up our time and resources just trying to make that thing work but not being able to do anything proper with it uh, so being able to slowly pull out those parts um, now over time and replace them with uh, better systems, which are more maintainable, which are actually a language that we code in, who'd have thought that'd be a good idea, uh, has been a great benefit. And that's kind of, I guess, what I was getting at with paying off technical debt and getting yourself into a, a place where you can invest in the future rather than pay off the past. With that, you grew a lot in less than two years, going from 10 million requests to 100 million requests in a month, I believe, um, and having to expand your server in- 
infrastructure and rebuild some of that stuff. Where yeah. did that growth come from, especially since you weren't doing any marketing? Ah, uh, gosh, I guess it just compounds over time. So, I mean, uh, the publicity of the Kickstarter campaign, which was actually born out of um, a blog post even six months before that, which hit the front page of Hacker News, uh, then the Kickstarter campaign hit the front page of Hacker News, and that kind of built up this immediate audience, uh, which was subscribed to everything we were doing. Um, on day one, when we launched uh, the actual uh, site and the products and everything, we already had 100,000 signups within the first 24 hours. Um, and so when you have that level of popularity starting out, you've kind of got this initial, initial, uh, level of traction that just keeps rolling and keeps building to some degree. And even if you're only growing 2% a month, it just compounds over time. And so, yeah, I mean, we were so by no means the largest, um, publishing startup in the world, but, um, the users that we do have are very loyal and, uh, quite frequently refer, uh, people with the same sets of values or uh, people with the same sets of problems that they need a, a tool to solve. And so the, the 10 million to 100 million figure is the actual number of um, requests to people reading uh, ghost publications and, and websites that we host. And so it's a combination of us growing customer base, but also our customers becoming more successful and getting more tr more traffic and, and growing their own audiences. Um, so yeah, lo lots of things, I guess. So you also wrote a bit about how your market has changed. Uh People aren't blogging personally as much. And then, of course, there's like Medium, which does allow people to blog. And, you know, it's that personal platform that a lot of people are using. What mm -hmm. does that mean for Ghost? Yeah, so that's a really interesting one. Um, Medium is such an interesting product. And I'm actually a big fan of what they're doing. And um, we've been talking to them recently about how we can uh, actually make Medium and Ghost play more nicely together. Um, I think Medium is like the currently the world's greatest content social network um but you have to understand that's what it is it's the social network so the biggest benefit that it has is this network effect so you can log on you can log in with twitter you push a button you can publish your content and it's going into a predetermined uh pool of people who are already engaged who are already uh waiting to read content and you're going to get great initial readership with very little effort. Um, and that's the biggest benefit of any social network. Of course, the downside to that is you don't own the social network. Medium owns the social network. Just like if you publish something into Facebook, um, Facebook owns who sees that, how long they see it for, um, which part of the algorithm it bubbles up into or doesn't. And so you're inherently, you have this initial advantage, but then a later inherent limitation to how far you can get. So I think Medium's incredibly attractive if you really don't want to deal with technology or infrastructure um, and you just want to remain quite small and maybe you don't care about the wider business implications of starting a media organization. But at a certain point, if you want to do anything beyond the confines of Medium, let's say you want to have a vid something as simple as a video in your header or your site to look a little bit different or maybe you know not to have the Medium logo on it, um, suddenly you can't do that anymore. So... Where we differ um, is that we're all about creating independent um, publishing organizations and helping those people succeed. So building their own sites, their own communities, their own networks, which they have full control over, right down to a single line of source code and right out to the wider community of understanding who every single one of their readers are and having full access to their readers' data. So it's the, the kind of way I sometimes put it is Medium's great if you want to participate in a wide community of people reading great content uh, and Ghost's great if you want to start one and build your own. Are your, is Ghost's analytics much different from the analytics provided by something like Medium? Uh, yes, in many regards. Um, the biggest one of which I would say is that Medium has a single analytics thing baked in where you can just kind of see uh, reading time, page views, referrals. Uh, and Ghost is open source, so you can plug in any analytics package that you want, whether that be uh, Google Analytics or Go Squared, um, Looker, or any package that you want. You have full access to the code. You can integrate uh, any type of data tracking package that you would like. Um, so it's it's far more open to be extended in, in whatever way you need it to be. So you also, in that post I mentioned earlier, talked about raising your prices. What do you think are the tricks for an effective and a smart pricing strategy, especially for a SaaS company? Oh, <laughs> I've spent I've spent so much time thinking about 
pricing strategy and reading about it and experimenting with it. Um, I think the only real conclusion I've come to is that there is categorically no right answer. Um, and no matter who has ever written about the subject before, whatever they wrote almost definitely won't apply to you. Um, because every market is different. Every industry is different. Every set of consumers or businesses are different. Uh, they all react differently. Um, and even at different times of year or different years, indeed, um, you can run the same experiment and achieve different results. So when it comes, when it comes to pricing, I think, um, we've always just tried to experiment, uh, a bit to see what will work best for us. So usually once a year or something, we'll, we'll try and AB test a new pricing strategy, see what kind of effects it has. But I think the only hard and fast rule, which I think probably applies everywhere is low pricing doesn't work. And by that, I mean like $5 a month and below type pricing doesn't work because the the amount of people you need to buy at that price point is so high that you quickly exhaust both your infrastructure uh, capabilities and your support capabilities far before the margins on those $5 accounts um, are ever going to add up to something significant. And equally, the $5 customer tends to be someone... Um, who values the products far, far, far less uh, than a $20 a month customer. And so we, so we started out with $5 a month pricing and, and quite literally after moving to $10 a month and now $20, um, we've seen a dramatic change in the, the type of customer that we get and what those customers value. And weird, you can have like half the amount of customers make twice the amount of money and the customers that you do have now will be three times as polite as the people you had before. So... Um, if there's one recommendation I'd ever give with pricing, it's go a little bit higher than you're thinking probably and maybe shy away from the, the bottom end. Yeah, it sounds like you can use pricing to determine who your most valuable customer is rather than the other way around. Yeah, absolutely right. That's a great way of putting it. What's your advice for founders who are working in an industry or market like publishing or the tech behind publishing that could totally change at any point given with competitors or market fluctuations, whatever it is? Any advice for them? Um, look forwards, not backwards. Uh, there are, I think there are certain things that never change and there are certain things that change all the time. Um, so you, you have a few things that, that never ever change. They always kind of run throughout humanity and history and, and no matter what technology was around at the time, they exist in some form. So obvious forms of that would be storytelling. Um, you can go right back to cave paintings, um, and folklore for storytelling. People always want to tell stories regardless of the medium of whether it's in moving pictures, um, or writing or anything else. So if your technology is about the thing and the behavior that people do, or if, sorry, if your company is about the thing and the behavior that people do, as opposed to the medium with which they do it, um, then you can kind of transcend a lot of these trends. Um, that being said, we're, so we're mostly about content, but with quite a heavy focus on writing. I feel like writing is probably the most safe, stable <laughs> medium that has ever existed. Um, and even, I mean, go back as, as far as you can, writing has kind of always been around. And I feel like no matter how cool VR uh, inevitably is, I think they'll probably always be writing. So I feel pretty good about that. Um, in terms of competitors, I really don't spend much time on it. Um, I think you can lose so much time obsessing about what competitors are doing. And majority of the time, the stuff they're doing just isn't even relevant to you. You're not the same company. You're not in the same um, state or the same level of funding or the same age or the same team. Uh, and things that they do well might not work well for you. So I think uh, it's not something that, that I think is worth spending a lot of time on. I think it's far better to to focus on the customer and the users uh, that you have and try and please them rather than trying to look cool versus uh, people in your space doing something similar. So that's actually an interesting point. As a content marketer and like content producer myself, I've been struggling or grappling with that. Am I just adding more noise out there? There's so much out there. How do you break through and really add value? Right. You, I struggle with ghost, that all the time. Right. How have you overcome this or have you like, have you experienced no. those challenges as well? Yeah. I don't think you yeah. can ever overcome that <laughs> to some extent. I mean, it's tough and particularly, uh, I mean, you as a content marketer must know, but also journalists, uh, the, the stakes have never been higher, particularly with the saturation of content in the world. You know, it's, it's not just produce one great piece of content this week. It's produced three by lunchtime and, uh, they better all be good and just throw as much against the wall and see what sticks and, 
Um, and then you have, you know, affiliate marketers and drop shippers and all these guys who just put as much out into the world as humanly possible to try and use the dragnet approach of just scraping the bottom of the barrel. Um, and I don't know, I don't know what you do with that. I don't know what the, what the answer is. Um, and we have struggled with it and do struggle with it to this day. I think even not from a, um, a company point of view, but from a personal perspective, I struggle with. Uh, what's to write about now and is it worthwhile writing about and um, do people really care and is it worth someone clicking on this from Twitter and, and spending five minutes reading it is it really adding anything to their day but I think in in some regards that's um, market conditions and there's some validity to it and in, in other gra- regards it's just the endless torture of being any kind of creative and, and constantly uh, suffering from that self reflection and questioning your own work and it's kind of par for the course so i don't know i wish there was not if you figure out the answer can you tell me yeah yeah <laughs> i just i tell myself that eventually people will get sick of click clickbait and go back to wanting like authentic yeah. journalism and eventually the internet will just clean itself up it's what i tell myself yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty much what i try uh, and tell myself too yeah <laughs> So any other words of advice for founders and CEOs working to grow a sustainable business in today's environment? I think switch off the noise as much as possible. And by that, I mean, I mean, Hacker News, I mean, Silicon Valley Press, I mean, uh, the tech bubble, which is so navel gazing in in everything it does and, and talks about, um, because there's just, there's so much more out there. Uh, and there's, you know, the old adage, we asked for flying cars and all we got was 140 characters. And I, I just think that's incredibly true. There's, there's so much um, insularness within the, the tech bubble uh, and there's so much more interesting things outside of it. And if there's anything we've, we've managed to do quite successfully, it's to avoid or at least to subvert some of those trends and go in our own direction. And every time we've done that, it has served us well. Every time we've gone against the kind of traditional thing of you need to be in an accelerator, you need to have funding, uh, you need to have a super experienced board of advest, uh, advisors and um all these kinds of things. Instead, we are open source. We give away our code for free. Our employees are spread over the world. We have no offices. Um, we started a nonprofit instead of a C corp. Uh, we did crowdfunding instead of venture capital, and all of those things um, put together have gotten us somewhere pretty special and somewhere that's not normal, um, or at least regarded as normal. Um, I think uh, David Heinemeyer Hansen, the CTO of Basecamp, also has a lot of really great writing of kind of. Um, Silicon Valley counterculture um, from the, their perspective of building a sustainable business over the last 20 years or so, um, which is great. Highly recommend uh, his stuff. Awesome. That's great. Thank you so much for joining us today, John. It's been a really valuable discussion. My pleasure. Yeah. Say hi to Paul. And also, I don't know if, if you know the story, but the original idea for Ghost was kind of ripped off from Gecko Board a little bit. We had this, uh, this dashboard in the original blog post. Um, which is pretty much like if I, I basically copied Gecko board and made it white and then, um, put that screenshot as one of the potential mockups, what ghost would look like. Um, and then that was how that was pre Kickstarter campaign, but that kind of led, that was a huge part of what got all the interest in it. I think I told Paul that once and he was laughing a lot. So <laughs> I didn't know that. That's funny. Someone else actually told me that their company started by doing like a rip off of Gecko board in college. That's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's great. Gecko board, creating yeah. businesses worldwide. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Gecko Board's Secrets for Scaling podcast. Hope to catch you next time.